Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come for the dialogue session with our guest of honour, Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet. The session will be moderated by Ambassador Chan Heng Chi, who is also Chairman of the Lee Kuan Yew Centre for Innovative Cities at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Ambassador Chan was the founding director of our institute as well. Ambassador Chan, it's over to you. Well, good evening. President of NUS, Professor Tan Ing Chai, distinguished guests, I feel I should say friends because we have all been meeting so often at IPS functions. <laughs> Now, this evening, we will have the Bicentennial Dialogue. It is an important dialogue. It is an important dialogue because we get to reflect on the past, think about the present, and ask questions about the future. Now, Singapore's history, we all know, is more than 200 years old. In fact, you know, uh, we have this book, 700 years of Singapore, the history of Singapore. And we know Singapore began with the founding of Temasek in the 14th century. And in the 18th century, 19th century, the British came to Singapore. But in the last 200 years, we've seen the continuous development of Singapore into a global city. There were political changes but it has been a continuous growth path. There have been ups, there have been downs, there have been ups again. There were good times, there were bad times, and we look for good times again. Now, this evening, we have Acting Prime Minister, Hing Sui Kiet, who will take our questions. And I will start by fielding just three questions but the evening is yours. And I am told you are all pumped up to ask questions, judging by the afternoon session. So, you know, please feel free just to stand up, raise your hands, and uh, there will, I'm told there'll be a laser light of some sort that will guide me to you. So we'll, we'll try and take as many questions as possible. So let me begin. Um, DPM, but let me begin with a story. And this is a story told by then by Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, who was minister mentor when he wrote up this story. And it has to do with Albert Winsamus. I think all of you know the name, Albert Winsamus. He is, in a way, the father of many of our economic growth plans. Ms. Albert Winsamus came in 1960 with the UNDP team to try to work out the growth plans of Singapore. And he met Lee Kuan Yew and he spoke with then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. And uh, Winsamus said, my advice to you is twofold. One, get rid of the communists. They will be difficult for you make it difficult for you to make economic progress. Two, don't get rid of the statue of Raffles. Lee Kuan Yew said he thought, easier said than done, get rid of the communists. But he said, keep the statue of Raffles, oh, that's an easy thing. So, you know, we progressed from there. So with that as an opening, let me ask, my first question to you, uh, DPM. Uh, what of the British legacy, since we're talking of history, what of the British legacy was critical to the, our success in post-independent Singapore? Well, uh, first, let me thank you, Hing Chi, uh, for moderating this session. and also thank the LKY School of Public Policy and the IPS for organizing this very meaningful uh, set of uh, events. So on the, on the question, first on your, the quote on the, uh, Dr. Winsamius, in fact, just a few months back, I was in Amsterdam and had lunch oh. with uh, Dr. Winsamius' son. And we had a very nice chat because I wanted to thank him for what his dad has done for Singapore. Because indeed, uh, what he did for Singapore really set us on a very different trajectory. 
So what is it about the uh, British, uh, you know, being part of this, since 1819, being part of the British Empire meant for us? I'll say a number of things. First, the very fact that we are speaking in English now is uh, a very important aspect of that legacy. I think we, if we had been colonised by a different power, our history would have been different. And today, there are between one and a half to two billion English speakers in the world. And it's very much a language of uh, commerce, diplomacy, and uh, you know, people-to-people exchanges. So this is a very important part of, of the, what the British has left behind for us. And the other aspect will be really the, the rule of law. And Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was a student of law in, in the UK. And when he came back, he had a very strong conviction that you know, the rule of law is important for Singapore. And that is why we had such focus on enacting the right laws, enacting the right institutions to, and to manage this. And of course, the other aspect of it is how it opens, up, opens us up to a very different set of relationships around the world. By being a free port, it allowed for people from all over the world to be in Singapore. And we very much became a migrant nation. That we have people from all over the world, particularly from the region, but also from uh, you know, Arab traders and so on, that came to Singapore. And that's how we became a very multiracial and, of course, also very multi-religious. And the pledge that we take every day now, you know, regardless of race, language, and religion, is now a very important part of our legacy and a very important part of our future. So I would say that uh, being open has allowed us to be, the, the British took us on a different path. Now, what is very interesting too is that we are having the bicentennial celebrations, but we are taking this opportunity to not just look at the last 200 years, but looking at what recorded history, what evidence of history shows about Singapore's place in the world. And uh, for 700 years, we have been an important trading hub. Uh, we have been a, a part of a tr vast trading network. And Singapore was not just a sleepy village <coughs> when Raffles came. It was already quite a major port. And those of you who have been to the Asian Civilizations Museum, you'll see a very interesting exhibit of the tank shipwreck. And even in those days, it was, you know, we are part of this vast trading that is taking place all around the world. And I think it's important for us to continue to be very plugged in. So I'll say the British left us many important institutions, including, of course, now our system of governance, which is a parliamentary democracy. But we have changed uh, and evolved our system to suit our needs uh, since then. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, from the British, we're still looking at history. Uh -huh. I'm going to move to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Yes, what do you think then were Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's most important contributions to Singapore? Well, I, I think what, there have been so many books written about, uh, about Mr. Lee. And uh, you know, when we were celebrating Singapore's 50 years of independence, there were a number of books that were written specifically on, on that. And when Mr. Lee unfortunately passed away that year, uh, there were even more books written about it, uh, in, including the books like Great Ideas of Lee Kuan Yew. And Mr. Lee himself had written a number of these books, including his own memoirs. And if you ask me, I would say that his role in nation building was really critical. And what it means, what does it mean to be a nation? What does it mean to be one people? And if you look at what is the events around the world uh, where race, language, or religion has been a major source of tension, I think we have been very fortunate that since 1969, you know, for the last 50 years, we haven't had a race riot. And this belief in multiracialism, multiculturalism, being, staying open, uh, has been a very, very important part of what Singapore stands for. But I think the other very important contribution of Mr. Lee is really about Singapore's place in the world. How does a tiny red dot, a little red dot, 
survive in a world of nations, in a world of um, changing power relationships among major powers as well as you know, middle powers. And uh, what is our role? And Mr. Lee put it very well when he said, for Singapore to continue to survive and prosper, we need to be relevant and useful to the world. And to be relevant and useful to the world is a simple term, but in reality, awfully complex to navigate. So if you take, for instance, um, the, uh, uh, the recent uh, issues and you know, tensions between US and China, what is Singapore's relevance to this? How can we be useful? If you take the uh, problems at the WTO and the trade relations, again, what is Singapore's role? So those are things that I think we have to continue to think uh, very hard about. And I would say that Mr. Lee left behind a very important set of uh, issues, uh, set a very important foundation for our economic growth, for our security relationship, for our foreign relations, and importantly, for our own internal social compact. That uh, policies from national service to the housing policies, and I've been explaining to many visitors about that our HDB flats, for which over 80% of our people are living in HDB flats, are not low-cost housing. These are, homes, these are homes for people for which our people feel very uh, attached to, and it's a very important aspect of our nation building, that having a, home, having a place that you can call home, and having a home of your own. So whether it is uh, the housing policy, or, and now increasingly the uh, healthcare policy, and also education policy, I was education minister for five years, and I really enjoyed that stint and learned a lot about what we did, uh, not only to educate our people in the one, two, threes and ABCs, but more importantly, in the value system that we have and in that commitment to a multiracial, multireligious society, and to encourage our young people to be at their best you know, so that every generation can be better than the previous generation. So all these are important legacy, and I'll say that the biggest contribution of Mr. Lee uh, is really in governance. In fact, when he was alive, he only allowed one is something to be named after him, which was the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, because he believed that we must continue to look at governance and leadership because governance is key to how we build our societies you know, in every nation, in every country, but particularly so for a multiracial, multireligious uh, nation of very, very diverse people. Yeah. Now, DBM, I hate to contradict you, but uh -huh. uh, I have to say he allowed more than one thing to be named after him. Uh -huh. He was still alive when he named the Lee Kuan Yew Center for innovative cities. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there are two, two institutions named after him. And I keep telling my researchers, just bear that in mind. Now, if I may just... Continue. I'm so happy to hear that, Heng Chi, and uh, I do apologize <laughs> to the director of the centre. <laughs> 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 no, if I may just quickly summarize and uh, thread the two questions. The British came and their legacy was to build, first they founded and they created the port and founded this trading port and opened us in a bigger way and at the, the times allowed for it to, to link with the world. And they brought in, in a very major way, promoted immigration yes. to Singapore to give us this diversity and this heterogeneity, which is in fact cre very good for creativity and I think it enriches the population. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew had to build this and his colleagues had to build this into a nation, the diverse people. But he also left with us, according to DPM, the uh, idea that apart from that we must be a nation, how do you create a nation? And that's something we work at all the time. Mm. But also that he made us 
understand the importance of our geostrategic position and to be relevant in the world and to negotiate the geostrategic mm -hmm. situation. And thirdly, governance. Yes. And you spoke very much about how you, your, the ministers and the politicians worked at building policies. Right. Yes. Now let me come to the third question, which takes us on a different tack. Tomasek has risen and declined three times. In the 14th century, Tomasek was established. At the end of the 14th century, Tomasek declined because Malacca was founded, and that took away the attention and the focus. It was not till the 16th century that Tomasek rose again, this time serving as a port for Johor. Mm. You know, and so there was a second growth of Tomasek. But in the 18th century, the sultans who used the port decided they were going to move to Bintan. So Tomasek, again, sort of felt a decline or experienced a decline. And the British came after that in the 19th century and tried to build up you know, Singapore to be what we see today. And we built mm -hmm. further upon what was done. Do you see a time could come when Singapore would be marginalized again and that we would lose our position? And what should we do to prevent that? Wow, well, <laughs> that, that is a very deep question. And I would say that, you know, if there's one lesson in history is that one must never say never, right? Uh, events can happen. The question is, what, what can happen? And interestingly, I was just, you know, a friend of mine gave me this book by uh, Will and uh, Eric Durant on the lessons of history. And he has this very important line that life has no inherent claim to eternity, whether it is an individual or a state. So life has no inherent claim to eternity. And again, if you look at uh, Professor Wang Kong, who spoke to you all this afternoon, and he's, uh, he's an expert on the Chinese history. If you look at the rise and fall of the Chinese dynasties over the, the years, uh, China does not regard itself just as a nation state. It regards itself as a civilization. But even within the civilization, you see this rise and, and fall over the years. And uh, in the case of the nations, Many of us in this room will remember the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, I was just sharing with uh, Professor Frankopan that his family came from Yugoslavia. And years back before the breakup of Yugoslavia, my wife and I were on a holiday in Yugoslavia where we spoke, where people spoke about all the different aspects of it and how you know, nations broke up. And if you look at our own history, I think I would say that uh, can something terrible happen? Yes. What can possibly happen? Uh, we have to think very hard. One is really about natural catastrophe. And uh, the, in fact, I was interested that Professor Frank Open has actually been uh, reading about how um, eruptions affect the fate of nations, you know, volcanic eruptions. Now, when you think about uh, issues like climate change and how climate change can really, if it does happen, and in fact, global warming is happening, and if sea level rises, what PM spoke about, about why we need to build proper coastal defences, is something to be taken seriously. And even if it's a 50, 100 years, thinking ahead, planning ahead, we can take measures now to try and mitigate the effects of that. If you look at uh, pandemics, it was not that long ago, I think many of us in this room experienced that too, you know, during the SARS crisis, that it was a major event, not just for us, but really for the whole world. And with globalization, viruses travel at the speed that your, our planes can travel. And with the changes in the weather pattern, uh, these are not uh, issues to be taken uh, lightly. So I would say, one uh, is 
what can affect the fate of nations? Yeah, natural catastrophe. And by the way, for those of you who are interested, there is a very interesting series done by National Geographic with uh, uh, astronauts from NASA who had seen Earth from outer space and wondering this very interesting question, why is it that so far we only found life on Earth and not on any other planet, not on any other stars? And there's such huge interest in the black hole and in the other planetary system and man's search for are there life elsewhere? possibly more intelligent than us. And if there are, what will happen? But a key part of that, a part of that documentary which I was very fascinated with, is how over the centuries, yeah, over, the, not saying, over the millions and millions of years, we had catastrophe on Earth, when Earth was struck by objects you know, from outer space. And that could uh, decimate not just Singapore, but really the whole world. So I think that's one aspect. But the other aspect of it is that for Singapore to remain uh, relevant and useful and not to be overtaken, it's, it's a whole set of geopolitical relations that we need to watch. We hope that the world evolves um, in a peaceful manner, and in particular in this uh, trade tensions between the US and China, that we have some peaceful resolution, that we all commit to a multilateral system where whether countries big or small are treated as partners in this global system, where many of the issues that we need to deal with can be dealt with at the global level, whether it's climate change, whether it is pandemics, whether it is food security and so on. And I believe that uh, what the UN has set out in the Sustainable Development Goal uh, is an important aspiration for all nations uh, to aspire to and for all of us to make our little contribution in that area. But on the Singapore side, uh, about the survival of Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's insight on how we can make Singapore useful and relevant to the world uh, remains the critical challenge. How do we remain useful and relevant to the world? It is a world that's changing so rapidly that we'll have to change and evolve many of our systems in order to make our contribution to the world. And if Singapore cannot make a contribution to the world, we are no longer relevant, then nobody will be interested in our survival or success. And uh, therefore, we live in a very interdependent world. We have to learn to do our part uh, and to find systems and areas for which we can contribute, build cooperative relationships with countries around the world, uh, whether it is in specific areas. And in particular, in our part of the world, how do we maintain strong relations with our closest neighbours in ASEAN, and beyond ASEAN, Asia, and, and the rest of the world. So I would say that uh, those are important things that we need to do. But I would say probably the most important thing that we have to really uh, address is how does Singapore and Singaporeans stay as one people? Because if you look at the fate of many nations, what, why things broke up eventually is that people don't feel that they are one people. And the sense of unity in our country, in our nation, is critical. The feeling that you and I are Singaporeans and that we want to make Singapore work. We want to leave a better future for our children and our children's children. How do we maintain that? Now, that is the critical uh, question. And by the way, that, that is why I started this, uh, I, I launched this Singapore Together uh, movement and there will be activities in the coming days for us to continue to discuss this. You know, what does Singapore Together mean for everyone? What is it that you and I can do to maintain that sense of purpose, that sense of unity? Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, we have a little more than half an hour left, and the time is yours. So can we have the first question from the floor, please? Uh, there's one on the left and one and on the right. I can't see. Uh, there's one on. Why not we ask all of them? Oh, dance? is that? I can see Zaino, but were you the first hand? Oh, there were some on the mic, I think. There's some standing at the mic. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Please. One hand over there, two hands. It, it's me. Oh. Uh, please identify yourself just so we know where yeah. the question is coming from. Yeah. Should I say? 
Okay, uh, my name is Paul Tambaya from the uh, NUS. Uh, thank you, DPM uh, Heng, for coming and engaging in this dialogue with us. Uh, thank you also for mentioning viruses, <laughs> as you know, they're a real threat. Um, in this uh, occasion, when we commemorate the move from colonialism to self-determination uh, and democracy, uh, my question, which I hinted to you earlier on, was, uh, is there a good reason why we don't have a, a electoral commission which is independent of the Prime Minister's office? Because the election boundaries currently are decided by, uh, by independent civil servants, but ultimately uh, their reporting officer is somebody in the Prime Minister's office. And this is somewhat suboptimal in the development of a, uh, a full-blown uh, democracy. So that's my question. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Paul, for, for the questions. So, as you yourself said, the Electoral Boundary Commission is an independent commission. They, in order to do the Electoral Boundary properly, you do need to look at what are the population changes, what are the demographic changes that are happening. You want expert views on that, on how best to do this. And as you yourself pointed out, they are independent. So, if you look at what they have done, the constituencies Potong Pase remains where it, it is today. Hokang remains exactly the same as it is. And Aljunit in the last election remained as, as it is today. So I hope that you do not doubt the independence of this commission, that they are doing what is right. And uh, when I look at the, just moving around Singapore and I saw the amount of changes you know, in our new housing estates that are coming up, I was glad that we have a group of civil servants who are independent, who, do, who does this work independently, and who can advise us on what is the best configuration and the number of you know, members of parliament and so on to represent Singapore. They still report to the Prime Minister, though. Yeah. Thank you. Well, they, so do all other policies, but you are, unless you're saying that they have been the, uh, politically motivated, but as I said, you yourself said they are independent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, this can go on. <laughs> so I'll take the next question. Yeah. I think it's, uh, right, there's a lady in the centre there. Good evening, DPM and Hi. Ambassador Chan. Yeah. I'd like to hear your thoughts on China's BRI, specifically Chinese investment in mainland Southeast Asia and its impact on Singapore. Two um, implications, sorry, two examples specifically. First, the rise of competitive uh, Southeast Asian countries. Um, and secondly, the possibility of the Kra Isthmus project funded by Chinese investment made possible. Thank you. Uh, and because of that, um, my question really then is how do we remain relevant since we are trying our very best to uh, ensure that Singapore's survival is based on the interest of other, sorry, is in other countries' interest that Singapore should survive. So if we are no longer that relevant, then what would, what would be the case? Thank you. Yes. Well, oh, there are so that, many that parts. Is a, <laughs> that is a very deep question in many parts. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, I, I think the Asian Development Bank, for instance, has put out various projections and they estimate that you need something like $1.7 trillion of uh, infrastructure investment every year in this part of the world. It's a, it's a huge uh, amount of investment. But I think what the Chinese have focused on, and they point out a very important problem, which is that we need investments in infrastructure. We need to build connectivity. We need to build connectivity in airports, seaports, you know, land links. We need to build connectivity in our trading relations. And we need to raise efficiency of many of these things that we many of the uh, uh, facilities that are needed for a more globalized system. So I think the, the Chinese have identified a problem that quite well. But I would say that, and therefore we, are, we, we support the uh, Belt and Road Initiative because I think it is a good set of measures. But we also welcome uh, many other initiatives that have been put forward by various governments. Uh, the Japanese, for instance, have also have their own uh, projects in this area. The uh, World team. Bank yeah. has very major investments in this area. So what, what can Singapore contribute to that effort? I think Singapore can play a useful role. And that is the reason why we have set up Infrastructure Asia. So Infra Asia seeks to 
match the demand and supply side for infra investments. On the demand side, we hope that infra projects are properly planned because they are of such long life and so costly that not getting a proper return, whether economic or social, will be very costly to the nations. So on the supply side, we also have a huge pool of savings around the world, many of which have not been as fully utilised as it could. And you are now also look, seeing a very major demographic transition, even in Asia, but not just in Asia, but all over the world. Asia has many countries with a very youthful population, many countries which are ageing. And the logical thing to do is to have the savings of a population that is growing older, for their savings to be invested in productive projects so that a younger generation in a different country uh, or whichever country they are from can make the best use of the savings to continue to grow the economy, continue to develop and therefore as all part of a broader effort to support the sustainable development goal. So I would say that uh, we, we are strong supporters of better connectivity, better infrastructure whether you call it the Belt and Road, whether you call it a free and open Indo-Pacific, it doesn't matter. What matters is, are projects done uh, rationally with good economic and social returns? If it does, Singapore is all prepared to support that. And in fact, uh, I was at the World Bank earlier this year to discuss with them what the World Bank can do together with Singapore. And the World Bank has actually put an urban infrastructure hub in Singapore. Now, your second related question is, does this pose a threat to Singapore? I would say yes and no. Um, but yes in that when countries elsewhere develop, Singapore cannot stay put. We have to keep changing. But morally, it would be wrong for us to say that other countries should not develop. That those who are at the top of the value chain will stay at the top and everyone else remain at the bottom. I had many interesting discussions with uh, colleagues in the region about how we can grow together. And colleagues in the region said, well, look, we, we do not be the one to just produce uh, uh, raw material. Can we have greater value add? And I think that is the right approach. So we would like to work with our, our partners to see how we can all grow together. What it means is that Singapore needs to change uh, and run even faster. And that is why we are putting such a strong emphasis on our uh, industry transformation and our economic restructuring. And I'm glad that uh, our businesses have been very much on board. Uh, so are our uh, workers with the support of the NTUC. So this tripartite approach to transform our economy is a very important aspect for us of uh, coping with these new changes. And I'll add just one last thing, which is the changes are not just going to be about belt and road and infrastructure. A far bigger set of changes that is coming is the fourth industrial revolution. And the fourth industrial revolution, with the infusion of technology into so many industries and so many aspects of our life, uh, will, be, will have a significant effect on each and every one of us. So the Germans came out with this Industry 4.0, and in Europe, they are really looking at Industry 4.0 seriously. Um, the Japanese came out with Society 5.0. Yeah. So I said, why Society 5.0? They said, well, the technology is not just useful for industry, it is useful for society, and we must learn to harness technology for a better society. So I say, well, we'd be very happy to work together with you because I think we need to do that indeed. Thank you. Now, there's a gentleman who's been waiting very patiently. Yeah. The floor is yours. Hi, uh, good evening, DPM. I'm good. Si Hao from Singapore Institute of Technology. So again, with the point of staying relevant and useful globally, so what do you think should the role be Singapore be playing or what stand should Singapore be taking with the ongoing trade war between uh, China and US? Well, I, first, I, I think that the ongoing tension between the US and China is not just about trade deficits or surplus. It started that way, but it has now become a more uh, difficult set of issues. Uh, I was in the US earlier this year during an IMF World Bank meeting, I spoke to uh, people on both sides of the house, as well as uh, people in the administration. And almost every group has some unhappiness with China, whether it is about industries, competition, whether it's about um, uh, 
the environment, whether it's about the human rights, the democracy, and so on. And at the same time, there are also others, other American uh, chairmen of very major corporations who told me something which is rather troubling, and they said, well, unfortunately, while there are some legitimate issues, there are also issues for which some American businesses have sort of jumped on the bandwagon and said, why don't we use this opportunity and secure an advantage for ourselves? And that uh, the Chinese should change this, should change that, so that we as an American businesses have more to do. And this came from a chairman of a very uh, major company. So I would say that, that the, the uh, issues are getting more complex. And from a trade war, it became a technology war. And from a technology, I think it's a longer-term competition of values and systems. What sort of values matter? What sort of system of governance matter? What is, uh, and on the Chinese side, I was in China uh, after my trip to, to, to the, uh, uh, before my trip to the US, and I spoke to a number of Chinese leaders as well as their think tanks and academics. And the Chinese also have their own set of uh, complaints that if you look at Chinese GDP, you look at the size of the Chinese economy, yes, it's now the second largest in the world, the largest if you go by PPP terms, but there are also many, many pockets of China which are at very low levels of development. The regional inequality is quite significant. And, and even within cities, uh, inequality within the city is also significant. So the Chinese also have a set of issues that they need to grapple with. They have to grapple with uh, inefficient state-owned enterprises and so on. So I would say that both sides have very major issues to deal with. I, I actually posed that question to Professor Graham Allison when he was here recently. As you know, Professor Graham Allison wrote this interesting book called Destined for War and talking about the danger of the Thucydides trap. And uh, I, I asked him, you know, what is the best thing that US and China should do? And he, he has a very interesting answer. Now he thinks that both sides should first and foremost deal with what they have to do, what they have to do as a nation, resolve many of the internal problems that they have. And in the case of the US, you have many parts of the US which have not benefited from globalization. That's why they felt that you know, this, this uh, uh, call to make America great again and to revive old industry has a lot of resonance. And I, the US will have to deal with uh, major issues in this area about keeping itself relevant. And I went to Silicon Valley and spoke to many of the Silicon Valley firms, and I do believe that they have great strength in that area. And on the Chinese side, they will also have to deal with that. And both parties can actually do a lot to deal with major global issues. Both, are, both should play a leadership role in keeping the multilateral system going, in addressing global issues, and in working with the global institutions, whether it's the UN, IMF, World Bank, uh, to manage many of these major changes that are happening around the world. What can Singapore do? I'll say it's we can only uh, work together with like-minded countries, and I think there are many uh, uh, interesting countries in the, in the world who share our views, and we hope that we can be a voice of reason. In fact, my first trip as DPM was to Switzerland, and I met uh, many interesting uh, colleagues in Switzerland. Uh, the Swiss, like us, like to, you know, like a more peaceful world. We like to stay neutral, independent, and we like to be friends with everyone in the world. So I think let's find opportunities for us to uh, bring together many more like-minded countries. And we do that in, as in our UN in the 3G, right? uh -huh. the Global Governance Group. And I hope that we play our small role in, in that way. Thank you. There's a young man in front. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chan and DPM Heng. I'm a student from SMU. Oh. I uh, just wanted to ask, um, from a, um, According to my experience attending the Bicentennial experience, uh, I, I felt that um, this experience, this Bicentennial seemed to emphasize our 700 years of history as well as our 200 years being governed apart from Peninsular Malaya. 
honored to ask you for your own opinion on how do you think, how resilient is our state of multiracialism um, to ethnic politics from other countries? Thank oh, you. Thank you. Well, I, I think that's, that's a very important question. I was, and I'll say that uh, race, language, and religions are issues for which we must uh, continuously be vigilant because, as you pointed out, developments in other parts of the world will have an effect on Singapore. And it's not something that we can take for granted that we have arrived. If you look at bigger countries, it, even though they have long, longer history, racial relations, ethnic relations are never something to be taken for granted. But I would say that how can we remain vigilant? I mean, first, you have a, we have a set of laws, including the Maintenance of Religious Harmony Act, and the uh, you know, Presidential Council of Minority Rights and so on, which provide institutional underpinning for many of the things we do. We have uh, our policy of having schools in which we have a very good mix of students. Uh, we have um, ethnic integration policies in our HDB flats. And I think it is a very different um, world when people of different races, religions are mingling with each other all the time. And in our schools, you know, we do place a very strong emphasis on, on this. But at the end of it, I think it is what each and every one of us must do, which is, do we believe in these multiracial, multireligious? And if we do, how do we make sure that what we do express that? And uh, it's something which is always a work in progress, but we must try. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's a question. Uh, hi, my name is Don Hanna. I'm the chief economist for CIMB Bank and a former resident of Singapore. My question, uh, DPM Heng, is in your discussions, you've just emphasized in discussing the conditions within Singapore, a, a, a community that is both uh, race and, and religious blind, that has a, a sense of, of wholeness. The principle of the Singapore Bicentennial has at its heart, however, a nation state, which by definition is something that defines as separate a particular area from the rest of the world. The discussion you have of the role for Singapore to play focuses on creating a global environment in which small states or large states can effectually interact. Mm -hmm. My question is, how does one manage the concept of a nation state, which is inherently us against them, and the globalization that you are, are espousing both internationally and locally? Thank you. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question, but let me say that there's no contradiction between being a nation state and being a member of the global community. Because I, I think it's like... Um, it's like what I, I said to many of our companies in Singapore, that many of you are in, in the business. You are in the business of you know, running your own company, deciding on your own future. And many companies in Singapore, with, within the same industry, are also competing with one another. But there are areas of common interest for which it is in the interest of all companies to work together, but there are also areas of differentiation because you want to express your own belief, what you stand for as a company and how you add value to consumers in your process. So in the same way, I think it would be wrong for us to think that every nation must be like every other nation. I think the fact that you have a diversity of nation, a diversity of belief, is a good thing. And that we must respect the history, the culture, the heritage of different societies. And that while human beings are fundamentally the same across the world, uh, we do have differences in terms of our culture, our upbringing, our heritage, and even value system. So being a nation allows us to gather a group of people who believe that you know, this is a set of values and a set of heritage and beliefs that we uh, abide by. And at the same time, we stay open-minded and open to cooperation with people and nations around the world. And in fact, there are many common challenges around the world that all of us should work together, and even as we compete economically and in various spheres. And that it's like the Olympics, right? 
the fact that people compete in sports doesn't mean that you know, we are lesser human beings. But how do we compete with one another to push ourselves towards excellence and to be the best that we can be? But at the same time, we also cooperate to maintain peace and stability around the world. Uh, good evening, DPM. Oh, so. Is there a young woman There's there? Yes, on my left. They are waving. Right? Uh, <laughs> are, you, are you waving your hand? Thank you. Eh? They are waving frantically on the side. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> why, why don't we ask the two together then? I'll answer no, I'm together. going to take a series of questions. Oh, then. yeah. Okay. Is that someone asking for the floor? Yeah. Right. Oh. We haven't had a woman. Oh, okay. So All right. <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, DPM Hing. I'm Janine, and I'm from Raffles Institution. And my question pertains to the state of Malaysian politics today. So I was mainly wondering what you think will, what you foresee for the future of Malaysian politics. I think given, for instance, like intimations of rising Islamization in Malaysia, when you're looking at, for example, the Jawi script issue, or when you're looking at, for example, the formation of an Amnu Pass Pact. So I was wondering what you foresee for the future of Malaysian politics, and in particular, Singapore-Malaysia relations in relation Ooh. to that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That's a full lecture, <laughs> but very good. Yeah. Uh, over here, please. Yes. Very good evening, DPM. Oh. I've been waiting. Yes. I'm Muzaini Shaifi Sali from uh, Anglo-Chinese International. So back to the topic of inequality, uh, racial conflicts can be said to have blotted the modern history of Singapore. And given the rise of recent online discourse among uh, numerous youths uh, about systemic racial oppression in Singapore, as the former Minister of Education, how do you think that the infrastructure of national education can be improved to better tackle the threat that such fictitious and disarming narratives pose to fracturing and undermining Singapore's racial harmony? Right, that's the second question. Uh, over here, the hands. I saw a whole sea of hands waving. <laughs> that, that was fake. <laughs> there's, uh, questions there's, uh, here? Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> The laser sticks don't work. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, my name's Emily Ulchin from United World College. I'm a student there. Um, sort of one of Singapore's most prevalent challenges, which is further hindering socioeconomic development, is the lack of resources and specifically water. Um, so how do you think that we should meet this challenge and how does this impact us as a nation and how does this impact the Singapore-Malaysian relations as well? Okay. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, anyone else? Yes, here. Stand up, please. Okay, fine. Thanks. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, Matthew Ting from the Seven Foundation. Uh, yes, actually slightly related to uh, some of the earlier questions. Uh, in, in light of the current xenophobia that you see in some countries like uh, in, in the US and even to some extent uh, the UK uh, in terms of the Brexit, um, how, how do we, as a, as a small open nation, uh, resist this uh, xenophobic tendencies and, and, and still position Singapore as the place that uh, everybody wants to live, not just for, only for our, our own people, but also people from other countries? Thank you for the question. Yeah, any others? Uh, I, can we perhaps get uh, DPM I, I to answer? answer this, this. Right. Yeah. Uh, would you like to group the question yeah. on Malaysian? Yes. Uh, so you have and water. Uh, on yeah. uh, one question on Malaysia and one question on water. I'll answer the two together. Yeah. So first, uh, what is uh, what is our take on the state of Malaysian politics? I uh, in April I was in KL and uh, I had uh, I had a chat with uh, because PM was having a meeting with Dr Mahathir. We had our bilateral meeting. So we had a very good set of uh, bilateral meetings where we discussed what are the things that we can do together. Because we are the closest neighbour and there's a lot that we can uh, work together. And I would say that uh, there is the desire to have better relations to resolve some of these issues in a proper manner is, is very important. In fact, I, was at, I met Dr Mahathir twice in Tokyo at the Nikkei conference. And, uh, one of, and I mentioned to Dr Mahathir when I met him that he gave a very interesting speech at the Nikkei conference where he said, the days when you know, people go to war and so on uh, to resolve differences is just outdated. Now, what you need to do is that if you have any difference, 
let's resolve it peacefully, let's get international bodies to make the judgment, and we accept the judgment. And he specifically mentioned that, for instance, you know, over Petra Branca, yes. uh, we had the ICJ judgment, and they said, well, even though Malaysia was not happy with the judgment, we accepted it. And uh, similarly, when Malaysia had some disputes with uh, Indonesia, again over territorial claims, this was resolved. And uh, in, in that instance, Malaysia lost a claim, but Malaysia, also, I mean, Malaysia won the claim yeah. and Indonesia accepted it. So I, I think uh, abiding by multilateral set of rules and abiding by uh, agreements of this nature is key to, to good relations. I was in South America recently because of the G20 meeting in Argentina and had a chance to speak to many of uh, the members who are in South America who attended. And they were telling me about the long history of disputes among the South American nations. And, and one of them laughed and said, countries that are closest together have the most to do with one another and also have the most to quarrel with one another. <laughs> but it is how we settle those disputes that matter. So similarly, in the case of, uh, and you mentioned about the state of Malaysian politics, well, I had uh, uh, many interesting discussions with uh, uh, Ms. Anwar Ibrahim and uh, other members of the uh, Malaysian political establishment. So I'll say that um, I, I think it is, it is a work in progress. I mean, there are many important changes that are taking place. And as the closest neighbour, I wish Malaysia all the very best in this because uh, Good governance is very important in the development of nations and uh, everyone is looking at how they can improve the governance system and this is a positive development. Now in the case of the uh, water, the question from Ms Chen on, on the resources, indeed Singapore is very short of everything, right? that we are short of even water. Uh, so we have uh, discussions on this uh, water issue with the Malaysian government and uh, I, I hope that we, we can make good progress on that. But at the same time, uh, we ourselves have also uh, diversified our water supply and uh, our different tap policy from harvesting our rainwater to, uh, uh, to uh, new water and uh, desal water is progressing well. So I think we are in a very fundamentally different state today than it was, say, 20, 25 years ago. And, uh, I believe that uh, the technology will keep improving and that we have to look at this. In fact, Minister Masagos is looking at this very interesting issue of the circular economy, something which in the EU they have been doing a lot of work on as well, you know, on how we cut waste, how we recycle and uh, create a better flow of resources so that our, uh, our human activities impose uh, less of a burden on the planet so that we can all live sustainably. So those are all good developments. Now on the question of, uh, and we'll continue to grow our uh, different resources in meeting our needs, uh, including food. Right? So Minister Masagos has articulated a 30 by 30 plan as well as a zero waste plan. Oh. And uh, I had a lot of discussions with him and we are working very hard on this. One major part of our research agenda is on the urban solutions and sustainability. And I know there are many students here. I hope that many of you will also take part in this effort. Now, on a question on the inequality and uh, you know, what can we do in national education, I would say that uh, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned about national education. And it's very important for young people to have a sense of hope and also to be able to make a contribution. So there, I would just share one little thought with you. I was at a pre-U seminar when I met a whole group of JC students. And I said, what are you young people most concerned with? And they said, inequality. I said, why? They said, we can see that some of our classmates are doing very well, they are learning very quickly, some are not. So this must mean rising inequality in the future. I said, good observation. So I said, what can you do about it? They looked at me and they were quite stunned. What can I do about it? I say, yeah, you are JC students, right? And what can you do about it? And they were scratching their head and sort of wondering what is it that students can do. So I gave them uh, an example. I said, well, 
if you are a primary five student and you can read well, and you know that there are primary one students who come from you know, weaker backgrounds, weaker home backgrounds, who are not able to read so well, would you be prepared to spend 10 minutes a day during recess or, or you come to school 10 minutes earlier and read to a kid in a P1? Would that make a difference? And I say, oh yes, that's something that we can do. So I think the issue of inequality, the issue of many of these things, that, many of the changes that we need to make in our society is the work of many hands, the work of all our people, and not just uh, uh, Singaporeans, but all people, you know, we can join hands to work with others. So I, I hope that uh, our students can think more about it, and I would love your suggestions on how national education can be improved further. Because as students, you have a certain viewpoint, and I would love to discuss this, you know, at some point with our students. And in fact, many students came to uh, our Singapore conversation when I, uh, when I did that. And I hope that many students will join us in this Singapore Together effort. Now, on the last question on... Uh, xenophobia. Xenophobia. Now, this is again a very important question. That um, why is there rising xenophobia in many parts of the world? There are lots of studies on, on this subject about why we find it difficult to accept people who look different or who sound different. And I would say that, as the student raised earlier, that I think a lot of it starts in school, and I hope that our students are able to uh, embrace this. And I hope that our leaders in the universities and in various places can do a better job of um, integrating our students. A very good example is actually in NUS, and in Chai is here. I once visited a team in NUS, they were looking at innovation. And in the team, there were two Singaporeans and two Indian students who were studying in NUS. They formed a team to do a very interesting project on uh, using, they created a very good software. So I asked the team, there were two Indians and two Singaporeans, I asked the Singaporeans, why do you have partnered with these uh, two Indian he said, we can't code, they can code really well. <laughs> so I asked the two Indian students, I said, why do you find value in these two Singaporeans? They said, we can code, but they know the market much better. <laughs> so without them, we won't know what to, what, what to create. So to me, that was a classic example of how we can combine our strengths. Nobody is good in everything. Right? We are good in something. But it is by working together that we can harness the best of our strengths, and that together we can achieve more. And that's what every good organisation does. And I hope that that's what every society can do. Because by harnessing the strengths of people, judging people on the merits and on what they can contribute, rather than on the basis of their race, language or religion, uh, we can build a better society together, and indeed a better world. So similarly, we have to be very open to people from around the world. Because what Singapore can do you know, it's a fraction of what the whole world can do. And if we can partner with our friends and partners with like-minded uh, people from around the world, we can achieve a lot more together. Right, now we have two minutes left. There's a last question. Yes, right. Uh, hi, DPM. My name is Theophilus. I'm a young, young Singaporean. Yeah. I wanted to pick up on what you said earlier in your response to the question on inequality. Um, while I agree that Many Helping Hands is indeed a model that has served us quite well so far, I want to ask you a little more about what structural adjustments could be made to tackle inequality. I think um, many uh, observers who are much wiser than I am have pointed out that since 2011, there's been an expansion of social policies in Singapore. Right. We have tightened the social safety net, we have um, provided much more opportunities as well as support to the vulnerable. Um, and we have done much in healthcare, education, and social support, among other areas. Now, what's your prediction under the next Prime Minister um, about whether this trend since 2011 was simply a phase and the pendulum will swing back towards individual responsibility? Or do you think this direction will continue under the 4G leadership um, to, to see a further expansion of social services and support? Um, will this structural change 
tackling inequality in Singapore be something that's permanent or will it just be a phase? Well, I, I think that's a very important question and I would say that in order to answer your question, I would say first and foremost, we have to understand that you know, we are a part of the world. We have to understand the bigger forces that are going around in the world. Um, I actually addressed this issue uh, a few weeks back when I spoke about the rising inequality across the world. You know? Not just in, in any society, but really across the world. And, you, and that's part of the reason for this tension that's, that you are seeing now. That in many parts of the developed world, the GDP has grown significantly over the last 50 years. But when your, pop, when your demographics is changing and people are aging, you'll find that the growth slows. And you can no longer grow the economy by labor force growth. You have to grow the economy by total factor productivity. And TFP in many of the OECD countries are in the region of 0 to 2%. And in fact, you also have increasing economic cycle. We just had, we had a global financial crisis not that long ago. And since that period, we, it has been a, a very bumpy period since then. We have just gotten out of, of that. So you have around the world rising inequality. You have the internet economy where the marginal cost of serving the next consumer is close to zero. So the network effect is increasing inequality significantly across the world. Now, what is it that Singapore uh, can do? Oh, you also have, by the way, increasing polarization of views. Right? And what is it that Singapore can do? do? What else do we need to do in social policies? I would say that social and economic policies are closely interlinked. Because if the economy doesn't grow, you would not have the resources to uh, help our people. The country will not have the tax collection, the revenue to do good social policies, however good-hearted you know, and however well-meaning we may be. Uh, but at the same time, for most individuals, having a job is the best that you can do for everyone. And hence, our, our policy about workfare not welfare. It's a very important aspect of it. And if you look at the income growth, uh, we have many significant uh, top-ups. And the key is that the big plus in us is that our workers are very willing to learn and you know, to, to unlearn, relearn, and learn new things so that, you know, to learn, unlearn, and relearn new things. And the industry transformation efforts put a very strong emphasis on getting companies uh, to work together with us, on raising the relevance of our institutions of higher learning in vocational and professional training. So I think we must continue that as, as the first pillar. Then on the, uh, for the groups which are under greater stress, you know, in particular our older generation, because they grew up at a time when Singapore's economy has not taken off yet. They have much less savings, and that's why the PG the Pioneer Generation Package and the Medica Generation Package uh, are so important for them because I think it is important for us to look after our seniors who have contributed so much to Singapore in the earlier years. And the one good quality that our seniors have, which I have great respect for, is how responsible they have been. I think some of you may have heard this story, which I think was reported in the media before, that uh, during one of my Meet the People session, there was a lady in her... Uh, in her 70s, who waited over two hours because I had a very long queue that night, who wanted to see me. So when I saw her, I said, how can I help you? And she said, I want to make a complaint. So I thought, wow, is she unhappy with some government departments? She said, no, no, I, I want to make a complaint against this dentist that I went to. Because this dentist that she went to had told her that instead of just she wanted some cleaning you know, and some uh, checks. This dentist found so much problem with her and said, oh, you know, dear, you need to do this, you need to do that. You... And she asked, her first question was, how much would it cost? She said, well, it's a thousand over dollars, but don't worry, it's free because you are part of the pioneer generation. The government will pay for you. <laughs> and she said, no. How can you? I don't need all those things. How can you cheat the government? <laughs> yeah. So she said she walked off and went to another dentist who then did all that she wanted to do and charged, and I think she paid like $50. <laughs> so she said, Mr. Heng, this is unfair. 
how can someone who is so well educated and a professional <laughs> try to cheat the government, you know, through me? And I said, I have such deep respect for you. So the, the next morning, I called Minister Gan and I said, I have the most amazing meet the people session case. And I'm going to give you the details now. You go and check. <laughs> So Minister Gan immediately checked and found that, my goodness, he not only, had, this was not the first time he did it, he has gotten away a number of times and uh, action was taken against him. So that's why when I was in the Ministry of Education, I placed such a strong emphasis on character and citizenship education because the future of Singapore depends on the future of our citizens. You know, the value system that we have, the character of our people, and uh, it is, this is what will hold Singapore together. This is what will allow us to go forward. And it is this sense of being together and being part of a bigger team. And that is why I've spoken so often about the importance of partnership. You know, how different groups of people you know, with different strengths can partner one another to achieve a common objective, a common purpose. Because if you lose a sense of common purpose, if we lose a sense of togetherness, whether among our people or around the world, we are in for a, a bad time. But if we have that sense of purpose and that sense of community, then I think we can tackle many, many challenges ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, We've covered a very wide range of topics this evening. It's clear to me there's not that much interest in the past. There's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of interest in the present and even more interest in the future. And all of those who stood up to ask questions, and I think there are more who would have wanted to ask questions, have shown us this evening that really Singaporeans are thinking and thinking seriously. And I think, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, that bodes well yes. for us because mm -hmm. they've asked all the right questions, their concerns are in the right places. And for an OD like me, it's really very good to know that. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your questions. And on behalf of IPS. Heng Chi, you, you yeah. corrected me just now, uh, and can I take this opportunity to correct you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You are not an OD at all in my mind. <laughs> Let's give <laughs> Professor Chan a round of applause. <laughs> Don't Thank you think you. she has a very young mind? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And on behalf of IPS, Janadas, as the founding mother of IPS, allow me to say thank you to the audience here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.